Hello, and welcome to session two of our Tribal Youth and Substance Use series. Session two is application of culturally relevant screening and assessment processes and tribal best practices. And you're joining the OJJDP Tribal Youth Training and Technical Assistance Center. And we have our guests today, uh, Evan Elkin and Allison Kelly. We're going to read more about them and learn more about them here in just a moment. And I am your facilitator today, uh, Anna Rangel Clough, along with Courtney Yarholer from the TTA Center. And we want to welcome you guys and thank you for joining. We're going to get started here with a little activity uh, while we wait for others to get on board and online. So Courtney, if you want to go ahead with that. Certainly. <clears throat> thank you very much, Anna. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Courtney R. Holer. I am Sac and Fox Creek Pawnee and Oto from Oklahoma. and. Um, we want to welcome you today to this today's webinar, today's presentation, as we uh, discuss things that are ultimately, I was thinking about this, ultimately we're here to support uh, our young people, support our children, and to provide a safe space for, for our children, for our communities, for our families. And um, we know that the work, the histories that uh, have brought you all to this point today uh, they're all very meaningful and purposeful, and uh, we thank you for all that good work. And so as I look around um, throughout, you know, watching the news and reading different stories and uh, recognizing uh, the state uh, where we, of, 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 of things today, um, we'd like to open in a good way. And by doing that, because I know we can get distracted with the news and get distracted with all of these different uh, uh, things that we see, <clears throat> but I'm going to ask that you take a moment to, uh, and, and feel free to close your eyes with me if you, if you would like to. Um, if you don't want to, that's fine as well. But uh, uh, join me in thinking of, 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 of at least one child, one child that you have seen uh, with that, uh, that joyful smile on their face, that, uh, that um, smile, that emotional emotional tell that they are taken care of, that they are happy, that they are well, that they are connected, and that they have that sense of belonging. Now think about that child. Is that, per is that child maybe one of your children as they were uh, as, as, a, as a youth, as a child, uh, a niece, a nephew, a grandchild, maybe a young person, a child that you've worked with? Um, think about that and remember that smile. And then think about you as your role in what brings you here today and, and what you're doing, the sacrifices that you make day in and day out. It could be staying up late reading reports, uh, staying up late uh, looking at Excel sheets. You know, I don't know what your day-to-day -day consists of, but I'm sure it's very busy for all of those of us that work in the field of helping children. So think about those sacrifices that you make. And then lastly, I'd like to think, ask you to, to, to imagine and think of, of an elder, of an elder person that, uh, that looks back and, and, and able to see this, this young child and then your good works, and then they're able to share these stories. So think about them as we create this picture of a holistic community supporting one another. And this is, this is what we're working towards. So I offer that to open us in a good way, that we connect our children, our being, and our elders so that we can all support one another. But with that, I thank you for joining us, and we're looking forward to a wonderful presentation today. I'm going to turn it back over to Anna Clough. She's going to take us through, uh, oh, before, I'm sorry, before I go to Anna, I'm going to ask Mr. Uh, Nicholas Birdset. He's our tech support. He's going to uh, tell us some housekeeping uh, for today's webinar. And then following that, Anna will come in and tell us about our uh, objectives. Thank you. For joining us, and um, I thank you to Courtney for um, getting us started in a good way. And I do appreciate um, all of your joining and um, the personal responsibility you guys have um, to your youth and your communities and the way that you um, work with your teams and those 
um, that are involved with providing services to support your tribal youth. And so um, with that, we're going to get a look at today's objectives. Um, if you were able to join us for session one, um, we talked about community and tribal youth needs and strengths. And we're going to revisit that um, again because we're here today to talk about addressing those um, issues. And for those of you that weren't able to join part one, um, we're going to do a quick overview again. And then we're going to move into um, an examination of screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. Um, approaches to cultural adaptation and looking at some screening tools that are supportive to tribal youth. And then we're going to move into a conversation um, with one of our guest presenters um, about tribal best practices um, and supporting our tribal youth and communities with approaches that are, work well um, to support tribal youth. <clears throat> and so with that, I want to um, introduce our presenters today. Um, again, joining us is Evan Elkin. Um, he is a nationally respected innovator and leader in the field of juvenile justice, child welfare reform, mental health, and substance abuse treatment and youth development. He's a trained psychologist um, from New York University um, and has been a researcher for New York Psych Psychiatric Institute um, and Columbia University's Department of Child Psychiatry. Um, he has had many um, work experiences intersecting with public health and social justice and focusing on vulnerable populations. Um, he has recently served as the Director of the Department of Planning and Government Innovation for the Vera Institute. Um, he is currently the Director at Reclaiming Futures. Um, he is a national um, Reclaiming Futures is a national public health and juvenile justice reform organization. Um, they have 41 sites in 20 states across the country, and he serves as a consultant and supportive researcher um, for many different projects. And so we're really happy that Evan is joining us again. If you're interested in learning more about his career, um, we'll share his contact information with you um, uh, later in the, in the webinar. Um, again, uh, I want to say a thank you to him for joining. Um, also with us today is Dr. Allison Kelly. Um, she will be talking toward the end of our webinar. Um, she is a senior community health scientist and the founder of Allison Kelly & Associates. She supports research and evalu evaluation efforts for several tribal public health initiatives in the Rocky Mountain region. Um, she is leads MDT team of associates, and they work together to build capacity and understanding and infrastructure to support tribal communities um, and support community healing and transformation. Um, Allison has worked with many tribal communities and has served as an expert public health consultant, an evaluator, methodologist, epidemiologist, writer, and educator. Um, she has a master's degree in public health from the University of Alaska, Anchorage, and her doctorate in public health from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Um, and there's many other accolades and publications and things that could be shared about both of these presenters. We are just happy that they're here today to share about some of the work that they have been doing with tribal communities and in support of tribal youth. And we're just really happy that, that they are here. And so both of them will have um, sections of this webinar that they'll be speaking. And so we'll transition to them when it's time. But we're going to get started um, with a quick introduction and overview um, from the OJJDP Tribal Youth TTA Center. So um, I wanted to start with you know, a few of these images. And I know that um, <clears throat> when we're talking about tribal youth needs and addressing those needs, um, specifically with the initiatives that we support, um, generally focusing on you know, reducing um, substance and alcohol use um, in addition to the prevention of delinquency and uh, addressing that in tribal communities. And so I know that uh, these images, um, you know, they're, they're generally negative. We, we look at the impact that um, the use of these substances have on our youth, um, on our adults. And, and the way that our communities suffer from um, addiction and um, the inability to overcome some of these um, impacts. And so we know that our communities have the strength and the insight and the, um, the power to address um, these issues that have um, impacted our communities for, for many years. And so um, one of the ways that we're doing this is obviously by the group of people joining today um, to learn and, um, and evaluate where we're at um, and where we can go in addressing youth needs. 
So American Indian and Alaska Native youth, um, they initiate substance use at earlier ages than their non-Native counterparts. And um, we know that youth uh, have higher average rates of uh, marijuana, heroin, Oxycontin use, um, opioids when compared to other national data. And so um, I just wanted to revisit some of the data um, that we do know. Um, obviously, many of you that are joining today know that um, data collection in tribal communities, um, there can be uh, limited processes or accesses to some of that information. Um, but just understanding um, some of the information that we do have, it's, it's important that we look at that because this, this is what we're trying to address. And, we know that individual communities do have um, different issues that arise, um, especially the different substances that may um, be involved with the youth in your communities. But when we look at um, national data that we are aware of, it's, it's good to have a starting point for some of the issues that we're addressing. When we look at the use of non, the non-medical use of opioids with American Indian and Alaska Native youth over the age of 12, um, it's reported that they use at twice the rate of whites and three times the rates of African Americans. Um, and one study found that in 2013, um, among persons age 12 and older, the rate of substance dependence or abuse was higher among American Indians or Alaska Natives. And so I hate to reiterate some of the really dismal statistics, but um, that's what we're here to address. I don't want to read all these verbatim. I just wanted to share these for reference, because when you go back later, you can um, download this presentation um, and share, share these um, when you're working with your stakeholders and when you're um, working with your teams. Uh, we know that youth um, and substance use and dependence related um, health and social consequences include higher rates of morbidity and mortality due to this illness, um, injuries, suicide, homicide, other health and, and economic challenges. And so we know that um, when addiction is involved uh, with tribal youth that the impact is not only a present impact but also a future impact, not only on the individual but at the community level. Um, really, uh, from, from the point of time where there is an addiction identified, um, if there's no intervention, um, a lifetime of consequences that can be involved for these youth. And so that's why it's so important to continue working on these intervention processes um, and to really attempt to make an impact with the youth uh, in your community that are suffering uh, from any kind of addiction or you know, really at the, the family and community level of you know, what are we doing to support these youth and really develop processes that are going to make an impact uh, on, on this lifetime of you know, addiction if we don't address it at an early age. So I appreciate um, what our, our presenter, Allison, shared um, in her paper. Um, one of the statements was that this is a major public health concern, and I know that she'll address it later. Um, but it is because we're looking at um, the high rates of usage, um, the, the lack of effective interventions, and um, the need for a community response to address what tribal youth are um, facing when we're looking at substance use, addiction, um, and the consequences thereof. So um, with that, I'm going to let Courtney um, talk about addressing some of these challenges and approaches to doing so. Thank you, Anna. Uh, yes, what I wanted to do today was, um, <clears throat> as we know, Anna presented some of the, the, the statistics, some of the uh, um, negative uh, things that we see that we want to address, um, the impacts that uh, afflict our, our communities, our families, and our youth. But uh, what I wanted to do was attempt, before we introduce our presenters, was to attempt to set the context of addressing community challenges and uh, the community needs. So we know, and there's been a lot of discussions and, and writings about the impacts of historical trauma. Uh, recognize that that's directly related to uh, the increased daily traumas that our, our youth, our young people, our families uh, experience today within Indian country. Associated with that also is unresolved grief, the learned behaviors and negative coping skills, uh, and then we lead to, to other issues such as the disconnect from culture, cultural values, and indigenous knowledge. 
And so these, in a, in a big, broad perspective, these are some of the challenges that we are up against as we are beginning to try to address these issues uh, of, of drug use and the impact of drug use on our, our youth and our communities. And so again, we know it's, it, it's big. We know it, there's, there's a lot of work to do. And it can be daunting. It can be very um, overwhelming if we allow it to, to, uh, to be so. So I'm hoping that we can frame a context here where we can uh, take another a different look and different perspective at, at, at the strengths, at the community, at, 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 the, at the population, our families that we are working with. And, uh, frame it in a, in, a, in a new light and recognize that, yes, the answers do lie within. The, uh, uh, there are strategies, there are approaches that we can work together to, um, to, to reduce some of these ills that we see if, if afflicted on our, our youth. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to mention that for those of us that have, uh, I know there's many of you on the call here that have worked over the years in developing programs and uh, writing grants and uh, uh, obtaining sources and resources to, to support the communities, uh, we see some challenges in, in, in trying to uh, negotiate and secure those resources, the, the funding. And uh, some of those is um, when we're, we talk about there's this... Um, this idea or this, 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 this growing thing of uh, evidence-based practices. And uh, we also see that in some ways it can be somewhat of a mixed message. And so, you know, there's been a lot of work throughout the years, recent, recently throughout the years, of uh, building from culture, uh, cultural-based interventions, using cultural practices. But then there's also this other growing uh, knowledge of we need to use evidence-based practices. And so that's always a challenge when we're trying to do both. Um, and we see that as we're working and developing programs within tribal communities. Because not all evidence-based practices may have been developed for our American Indian youth. And so how do we navigate that, that uh, those requirements that these funding streams are requiring, and at the same time still uh, meet the needs of our community. And so, you know, I, that's another thing that we have to consider in terms of when we're addressing these challenges at that broader level. Another thing that I wanted to mention really quickly was the data collection and the reporting. You know, that's another area, I think, that uh, we oftentimes within Indian country, we don't always um, do the best job that we can in not only collecting the data, but reporting out and reporting the impact that we're having. I think, you know, I see a lot of, uh, many of us have seen a lot of initiatives throughout the years having a very positive impact on our youth and our young people and actually doing what they were meant to do. Uh, the, the initiatives and the, the uh, actually having great impacts. And so when we can begin to report back the impact and the good things, the good stories of our work, you know, that's going to improve our, our data collection. It's going to improve our opportunities. And so I just wanted to frame it this way so that when we, we think about these challenges, we can uh, think about uh, how we address these in a positive, uh, collaborative, cultural lens. So what I would like to offer is a very broad stroke idea of addressing our community needs based in community-based strategies. Now there are several, several uh, studies and resources and guides for uh, community-based strategies that we can learn from. <coughs> Excuse me. But community-based strategies very broadly, uh, is, 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 it's, yeah, I break it down into these three, uh, three circles here and, and, and present it to you in this Venn diagram of being very strengths-based and then building from the existing strengths. So we're not necessarily looking outwards for the answers, but we're looking inwards. So when we're building on community strengths, we, uh, we focus on, a rec we call it asset mapping or identifying our existing strengths, um, such as resilience. 
resilience. We think about, yes, the historical trauma and the impact of historical trauma and the learned coping strategies and behaviors and all of that. However, we also recognize that there's a lot of resilience there with our, with our people, with our kids, with our parents, with our grandparents. So how do we leverage and build off of that, that resilience within our communities? When we look at uh, evidence-based practices, when we begin to, to take this community-based, uh, culturally informed, strong connections to the community, all of these, these strategies, to uh, community-based strategies, uh, we recognize how we can take evidence-based practices and actually uh, implement do, doing cultural adaptation to evidence-based pra practices or, and also, uh, identify existing strategies within our communities, cultural strategies, and talk about things what we call, we're now putting language to it, and we're saying practice-based evidence, or even what we're going to hear today, tribal best practices. So recognizing uh, the knowledge, the cultural knowledge that lies within our communities and leveraging that and, and building off of that. Um, so again, that's building off of our community strengths, and we know we can go on and on, and we can have some very robust discussions about building off of our community strengths. But I want to keep it moving and move on to the culturally informed and knowing who I am, where I come from, and what future was prepared or prayed for. How do we work together today to help that future become a reality? So again, building off of those indigenous ways of knowing that cultural traditions, values, and knowledge. Uh, this idea of collectivism versus individual, individualistic. So going back and learning from that collectivist culture uh, and mindset of supporting from the youngest to the eldest, uh, looking at our family networks, our clanship systems, all of these things that were, were housed and within our, uh, our cultural understandings, our traditional tribal cultural understandings of the world, world views. So, Again, just reiterating that we want to make sure that we don't overlook those cultural worldviews, but they are included within the planning, within the thinking. We think about it through that lens. Um, let's see. Building strong connections throughout the community. Again, just as a natural fit of this community-based strategy of engaging our community. You know, I, uh, we, we, many of us may have heard of this, uh, this, this um, <clears throat> the, the medicine wheel models and uh, the various adaptations of that. Um, <clears throat> I, I really uh, appreciate the uh, Terry Cross model and um, how we, we look at belonging and uh, engaging in meaningful and purposeful belonging. So that what that does is that encourages and supports messages of hope. And so right there, when we begin to encourage and support messages of hope, we're beginning to gather our tools together to address those feelings of hopelessness and impacts of historical trauma. Um, the next stage being interdependence and independence, offering opportunities to build on our skills. And uh, uh, we know that the research is telling us now that strong communities, strong connected communities have less occurrence of acts of violence. So by having and building off of this interdependence as well as this independence, we recognize that we, ha we create safer spaces for our children and for our community members. Finally, mastery, um, <clears throat> opportunities that we hone our skills. And so we're creating opportunities. We have to think about how are we creating opportunities for our people to become engaged meaningfully and purposefully. And then finally, the last stage of giving or giving back and reciprocity, uh, sharing our knowledge. The ultimate, this is, we, I, I consider this the ultimate sustainable mentoring model. And when we get to the place in our community programming and our community-based uh, strategies where uh, the participants are actually giving back to the program or to the, uh, the, the practices and skills that they learned within the program and they're, they're sharing them with their, their children or their nieces and their nephews or their community kids, and um, just that, that, that idea of reciprocity. So again, those are all just very quick, broad brush strokes and touching on some community-based practices um, that as it relates to our tribal communities. Um, <clears throat> again, recognizing our existing challenges of historical trauma, evidence-based practices, the challenges with that, the data collection, all of that. When we begin to look at the work that we're doing in the program development within this community-based strategies lens, that's when we begin to build on resilience. 
that's when we began to adapt these evidence-based programs to where they are actually promoting our practice-based evidence or our tribal best practices. That's when we get to a place where we can support and are addressing our community challenges and building that resilience. And it's also more likely to sustain the behavior change that we're seeking. So we're not necessarily focused on sustaining the program itself, but the behavior change and the impact and the true impact of the community. So I frame it that way to hopefully give a little bit of hope and because it can be daunting when we look at the statistics, we look at the need, but there is hope there and it, it lies within our community. That, those, that resilience lies within our community. So think about that as we, we, we figure out ways to, to leverage that resilience as we begin our programming. Because I know uh, for, the, for our presenters as they begin to, to present, they're going to talk about uh, strategies uh, to address these issues. And they're going to use uh, some scientific words, but also recognize and try to hear it through this cultural lens and recognize that these strengths exist. And there's, there were ways traditionally of how our communities took care of one another. And that's really what these strategies that we're going to hear today are about. They're about taking care of one another. So again, I know that's very simplistic, but at the same time, it's very true. So I ask that you bear with this. You, 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 you open your, your mind and, uh, uh, again, go back to those images of those youth, of those children, of those elders, and we're creating the circle of wellness, and we thank you for your presence. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Anna to introduce our first speaker, and he's going to talk to us about the SBIRT process, screen, screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. And I will hand it over to Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. And I appreciate uh, I feel like I had to share kind of the, the unhappy facts. And then um, we want, definitely wanted to share um, that we um, want to focus on strength-based approaches to supporting our community youth um, and that there is um, that opportunity uh, to implement effective programs that will make an impact. And so. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, introduce Evan Elkin again. I know I read his bio, um, but thank you so much, Evan, for joining us. He is going to be talking today um, about his work, um, sharing about the SBIRT process um, and a few other approaches. So, um, Evan, uh, it is your turn, and you have the floor. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you both for, for framing this conversation so well and, uh, and in such an inspiring way. And I, I want to just... Thank you for the collaboration that we have, and you guys are very humble and didn't didn't really introduce yourselves in your program, but um, but the work that you do at Oklahoma University and in the, the uh, Indian Country Child Trauma Center and and in some of the early efforts to create really authentic adaptations of existing evidence-based practices and uh, building new practices that you and your colleagues. Um, and Dr. Bigfoot Circle have really been kind of a north star for the field and a mentor to all of us. So I want to thank you for that before I dive in, and, and thank you all for being here. I see some familiar faces in the uh, familiar names anyway in the in the attendee list. So it's it's a pleasure to see everybody. Um, I'm going to jump right in, and, and my part of the discussion I am as the, as uh, Anna and Courtney mentioned, I'm going to talk about a specific project, but I also want to i going to pull back the lens and talk about um, the framework that, uh, or the lens rather, that we look through at the work that we're doing um, here at Reclaiming Futures and in our work as, as collaborators with, uh, um, with, the, um, with the TA Center with Anna and Courtney. Um, we see ourselves as an organization, as a public health organization, and I want to get into a little bit uh, of what we mean by that, and I know we have a we have another esteemed colleague who's our next presenter who is also a public health professional. And many of you, uh, for many of you, this may be a little bit of review, but I, I think it's important that we, that we set the stage a little bit and understand um, that there are different ways of looking at the challenges and problems. And even though, Anna, I know that you say you, you presented kind of the, the you know, the, the downer, um, you know, eye-opening data, but understanding our community and what we're facing is an important part of a public health strategy, and I want to get into that a, a little bit more, um, and ways of, of lo looking at data and ways of looking at problems and solutions. Um, and then I will get into this unique collaboration that we've been lucky enough to, um, to be really facilitator and catalyst for the development of uh, 
new practices, uh, and just sort of like the way a coach stands on the sidelines. We've been working with tribal communities to help them develop their own screening and brief intervention um, models, um, and just serving really as a, um, as a helper in, in that process. So what do we mean when we talk about public health? Um, and I hope that the font on these is, is readable. I'm going to walk through this. There's a term that we use in public health that will be familiar to some of you, um, which is the social determinants of health. And related to that are, are the, the norms of wellness and what we think of as uh, you know, the, the aspects and elements of a healthy life and, and, and or a, a well community or a family. And these are things that have, um, that have power just unto themselves. They're the, you know, the way we define uh, the way a family should operate and what nutrition is and how to keep ourselves safe and how to function as a, as a social group so that everybody, uh, as Courtney mentioned, the, the importance of the collective. But the importance of the collective is a concept I think that resonates particularly strongly with tribal communities that is one of those social determinants of health, a community that disintegrates and, and, and doesn't effectively put into play that instinct toward collective and, and mutual support is likely um, to fall into a state of unwellness and, and see some negative outcomes. So really the, the heart and the start of this wheel that I've created here to describe public health, the heart of it really is in those fundamental threads, uh, many of which are cultural in nature, that keep, uh, that both define what health and wellness is, but also keep everyone healthy and, and well. And these are things, this is not the emergency room. This is not necessarily prevention. Um, prevention is kind of the next, the next toe in the water step that you take in a public health perspective of trying to prevent potential pitfalls. Like the, the, known, the known pitfalls that we know our community can sometimes step in particularly our youth, and we're here to talk about youth, like what are, what are the traps that the world kind of sets for us, and how can we help our community uh, to stay away from those? And, and prevention can be things like the way as a community we message to each other. What do we put on our billboards? Um, and what are the messages that our, the principals in our schools typically give us at the, at the beginning of an assembly when we speak? And what are the what are kind of the themes um, and you know activities that we are that we design, like mentoring programs, because maybe we know that young people may be suffering from a, a lack of opportunity to connect with caring adults. So the kinds of things we do that again are not the emergency room and they're not treatment necessarily, but they're done to kind of prevent people from stepping on those tripwires in their lives. And then you know, the next step in the wheel really is how do we notice things when they're going wrong? What are the early warning signs? How do we know when someone doesn't feel well or isn't acting well? Or what are the behavioral signs that somebody may be getting into drugs and alcohol, et cetera? And so in that piece of the public health wheel, we use tools. And uh, screening tools are kind of the first step. Usually they're, they're brief, few questions that we ask people routinely. And I always joke that my mom uses a screening tool called the MOM, which is she, she can just sort of listen for a tone of voice or a particularly atypical timing of a phone call um, where I claim to be just calling, you know, just to talk. But she knows it's because there's something specific that I want to talk about. And uh, we, do, we do screening intentionally, and we also do it relationally, um, that people who, who know and care about each other and see each other regularly and have their eyes open to see each other will notice. And so um, I'm previewing for you a particular view of screening that you're going to hear about later when I talk about our approach to screening and brief intervention. Um, so screening and assessment and how we decide, you know, does this person need to go to the operating room? Do they need to really just need to maybe um, get back to the good things that they were doing. So triaging, which is a word that's often used in an emergency room, is how do you decide who goes where for what kind of help? And that's a public health concept. The next step, obviously, is are the therapeutic and treatment and healing kinds of interventions that we build in our communities? And, um, and where are they situated? Um, where do we put those? Are they readily available? Um, are they culturally resonant? Do they, 
do they offer a prideful opportunity for people from your culture, whatever culture that is, to enter across that threshold into that treatment environment? Or is it far away physically, geographically, far away culturally, and, and, and or unfunded and not available in your community? Uh, one of the examples I'm going to talk about later is our work with, uh, with the Yurok Indians in Klamath, California, where um, a big portion of the tribe lives about an hour and a half by boat up uh, the Klamath River. And to get to their nearest clinic is another, say, hour, hour and a half or so by bus um, to the next town. So geography is a big deal uh, in, in that sense. Um, and I won't yet get into the cultural geography that also sometimes impedes that particular community and other communities from accessing treatment and therapy in a, in a prideful way. Um, and then from there, we get back in the wheel, back to what community and culture and society does, and how do we help sustain people who have gone off track or who have been unwell and are now well again and or stable, how do we, how do we sustain them? And what are the things that are back to the social determinants, the good things about family that help sustain people? And we know that often some of those social determinants the family, uh, you know, perhaps not being together, uh, a community without the kinds of resources, may be part of the root cause that set us on this wheel, on this path toward unwellness, that in order to sustain wellness and recovery and help someone stay well, it's those very same social determinants that become uh, extremely important once again, and perhaps the most important things. So. Um, when you hear about this public health lens, um, I'm going to show you some different systems in a second, but think for a second about where you feel most of these uh, elements to the public health process, where do they reside? Um, which of these do you think are most powerful and potent um, to be emanating from your culture and from tribal uh, communities and practices themselves? And which of them, them come from family and relationships and social relationships? And which of them do we uh, uh, do we rely upon institutions and other settings outside of family, community, tribe in order to, in order to access? And I think this is a critical uh, driver for the work that we're doing and a critical part of the questions that I think uh, we all kind of puzzle over, those of us who work in the, the youth and family and community uh, wellness field. So the question I just asked really is, so where does public health live and where is most of the action? And this, is, this graphic is not an exhaustive list of places where these things happen. Um, and I situate tribal community within larger community because I know I'm mindful of the fact that tribal communities are embedded in, in sometimes hostile and uncomfortable ways in a non-tribal setting. And that's been the case for hundreds of years. And so understanding the relationship of your environment, your culture, and the larger community and larger jurisdictional community uh, in cases where you're doing this public health practice that I'm talking about um, in a justice setting. And I noticed that some of the folks who have signed in are working in a justice setting and much of our work happens there too. Um, and then the family, of course, is, is an important place where, where the noticing, the preventing, the healing and the wellness, and is also uh, a catalyst and a bridge from, from the tribal and cultural elements. Um, from the tribal community. So there's a lot of action in the family setting as well that's critical to public health and wellness. Um, we bring in school and peer environment because, not just because it's where kids spend a significant chunk of their, of their day and their week and their school year. Um, I just uh, w took a picture of my son who just finished first grade and took a picture of him standing in front of the blackboard and they had a, they had a little day counter uh, thing that they wrote every day, and, and his last day of school was day 168, and that's where he spent, you know, more than, you know, more than half of the days in, in the year he spent in a room with with a teacher in another community other than his family community, and it's a very very important place for those things to happen, for the noticing, for the preventing, for the for the intervening and responding, and all of that. School is of tantamount importance. And finally, and I intentionally make it small here because it's sort of uh, counterintuitive, the importance that, that the justice system has generated um, in, our, in our lives, and particularly in the lives of minority communities and in tribal communities, the importance that the justice system plays um, as a practitioner and a, and a first responder 
um, in, in situations where public health and these other settings um, may be better suited to respond, but for various reasons, and we can all talk about and speculate the reasons why the justice system has begun in some ways to overfunction as a public health tool and device in, in the lives of not all people, but, but certain communities. And it happens to be the most vulnerable populations for which that is, that is most often the case. So looking at those domains from, from the embedded circle diagram, um, I would venture that over-reliance on any one domain is a sign that the system is out of balance and that we're not properly tapping into the resources and strengths of the other domains. The fact that we have really come to over-rely on the juvenile justice system as a place where behavioral health and substance use issues are, are addressed for young people is a sign that something is wrong and that uh, the resources in the community and the tribal best practices um, are not allowed to step in and notice, prevent, uh, inspire the wellness in those young people. They're, you know, the, the system is not at times intentional in the way that it recalibrates itself. The fact that juvenile justice is over-functioning is, um, although some may argue this is not an intentional plan, but it's something that kind of happens unfortunately in a kind of an organic way, but can be corrected. And our work is really about this third bullet, which is that um, the power of family and the power of culture has really been underutilized from a public health standpoint. And although we give uh, you know, a healthy dose of lip service to the importance of being culturally sensitive and to you know, adapting and, and um, you know, I've, I have heard the, the somewhat ironic term being used just putting a few feathers on a, on a non-tribal evidence-based practice does not make it culturally sensitive. There's a lot of practice that is, um, that is two-dimensional and, and superficial. Um, and lip service, for example, to the importance of family in places like family court, where <clears throat> you even have the word family in family court, but family does not often have a voice in that conversation, in the planning, and in the solution. Most families attend. Uh, because they feel that they have to and they have their head down and don't speak much. Um, and so our efforts have been about trying to mobilize <clears throat> those underrepresented and underutilized elements uh, of, of this diagram here and to, to try to create more balance in the tools and in the, the programming that we create. And, you know, the other barometer that we use where we know this is the case is that we see for tribal youth and youth of color and, and LGBT youth and a lot of the, uh, the young people that the data is showing very starkly are not uh, showing um, the same kinds of outcomes. Anna shared the kind of the prevalence, the substance use prevalence rates for, for tribal youth showing that they are significantly uh, more alarming and, and, and problematic than non-tribal communities. Um, the same is true for the outcomes of other systems in terms of school discipline, child welfare, juvenile justice. Um, tribal youth are much more likely not to be offered therapeutic alternatives to traditional justice practices and have significantly poorer outcomes on every indicator of, of, uh, on the justice continuum. So leveraging and bringing to bear real collaboration across these domains, meaning bring the family into the conversation in an authentic and maybe to some radical way, um, and, and bringing culture and community into the process of developing, uh, developing new practices. So I'm going to talk now about our, our work around ESPERT, where we attempted to do some of that. So um, just a word about ESPERT. It stands for Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to, and I hesitate to say that it means referral to treatment, because in a standard you know, bell curve, population curve, um, it's actually very few people um, in, in most settings that end up being kind of in, in the red zone and need a referral for a therapeutic intervention. Most people uh, kind of live sort of in the middle of a normal curve. And when you do screening, it's like, oh, you had a couple of indicators. And so to have a fuller continuum of the kinds of responses that you might want to make to intervene, including prevention, so that it's not just black and white. I sometimes joke that you know, so there are many communities and 
and this was true of our juvenile justice system a couple of decades ago, it was like a hospital that only had an emergency room and an operating room and didn't have community prevention programs and a continuum of service. And so everything was kind of black and white. If you, were, if you had one toe in the water, you were all the way in the deep end. So we, we've kind of rewritten the acronym for ESPER so that it can be referral to. And referral to may be a referral to positive family activities or a referral to positive youth development activities or no other non-treatment alternatives referral to closer connection to, to tribally based activities and you know getting getting involved in 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 the music and in the dance of the culture um, may be equally relevant, equally healing for a person. And that doesn't mean we always jump to treatment every time someone you know shows a minimal sign uh, that we notice. So Esper in that way is a compass and not a map. It's really as I mentioned, screening is about just sort of noticing early signs. There is no one screening tool uh, that one uses for that, you know, and I mentioned, you know, the, the, the kind of ironic example of my mom and her effective screening tool. But teachers are also trained noticers if they're good, and, uh, you know, in, in communities we, we do that too. And then other kinds of screening can be much more formalized, a set of questions that are designed to kind of predict whether someone uh, is likely to have a treatable concern or disorder. Um, and the other part of ESPERT <clears throat> is the brief intervention part is about motivating and empowering the person and the people around them to take the next step toward wellness. And that's what is meant in almost every iteration nationally of ESPERT that is used. And ESPERT is used in doctor's offices now, schools, it's becoming quite a universal public health intervention. And the brief intervention part of it really is about not necessarily the referring, that's not always the punchline, but motivating the person to consider their own wellness and contextualize their signs and symptoms for you themselves in a way that helps you to collaborate with them to take a next step toward wellness. Um, and in our view and in the view of many of our colleagues, something like ESPER, and particularly for young people, is not something to be endured or applied to just an individual, that it's a community process as well. And for young people, um, it should include parents and family in that process, particularly around the planning for any change that is kind of uh, emerges from the process or referral that emerges from the process. That family and parents need to have input. So we in about three years ago at Reclaiming Futures, took kind of a deep dive into the screening and brief intervention world. And for those of you who understand the work of Reclaiming Futures, many of you probably have not um, heard of us or know much about us. But we, um, about 20 years ago, were launched to try to bring this public health perspective to juvenile justice and to the courts. And to try to structure uh, a framework to superimpose on court practice that allowed for uh, juvenile justice settings and court systems to connect with community resources and family um, and treatment organizations in different ways and new ways that are more collaborative. And so we saw screening and brief intervention, which is typically situated, um, you know, kind of early in a, in a process, in a continuum. And so we experimented early on with situating screening and brief intervention um, upstream of court involvement, as far up as we could go, um, and uh, implemented in, in schools and school discipline uh, environments where young people were offered an opportunity to uh, do a screening process and tell their story um, prior to entering into a discipline process. Um, it's being used in our, uh, in our network of sites around the country. Um, and I mentioned that we have 41 sites around the country. It's actually up to 45 now are using ESPERT as kind of an intake and early decision-making tool to help understand what the right thing, what the right disposition is for young people. Um, and also, just the idea that screening can be an opportunity to engage young people and to do some of the things that I talked about earlier, which is how do you, uh, how do you achieve a better balance in, uh, in that public health diagram with all the domains where health and wellness happen and are generated. We saw ESPERT as an opportunity to pull the youth and the community and the parents into the process in a way 
um, that is more authentic and to help them define a tool that it itself might uh, structure a better balance. And so um, we started a project a couple of years ago um, of adapting SBIRT for tribal communities and for tribal youth. And to really serve as, to bring our expertise in this work um, and, and to bring a role more in line with, with coach and um, co-author, catalyst, mentor for tribal communities to develop their own um, kind of from the ground up a grassroots public health tool that fits within the roadmap of Esper, but has the stamp at every step of the way um, of their own um, of their own cultural metaphor, community needs, um, et cetera. And what really drove that, um, besides the invitation that we had uh, with the Yurok community because of a kind of a public health crisis that was unfolding there, many of you may know that in the last few years they have had a, a suicide epidemic among their young people, that we were invited into a conversation to begin to uh, think about some solutions and, and resources that might help that community. Um, it was an opportunity uh, to kind of bring Esbert into that conversation, but also knowing that tribal communities are often not empowered to use their tribal concepts and practices uh, around wellness in justice system contexts. And I would venture to say, and this may be controversial for some, that that's even true in many of the healing to wellness courts, where because of pressures to <clears throat> adhere to procedural justice practices that are universal and, and, and not tribal in nature, that it's sometimes hard uh, to introduce uh, effective and actionable tribal concepts into, into those justice settings. Some have done beautifully at that, um, as I've observed. And I apologize for <clears throat> starting to lose my voice with this cold that I have, but I think I'll, I'll make it through to my next few slides. So I want to talk about, so how did we do this? Um, our methodology for um, trying to bring expert um, to tribal communities as a blank slate and allowing the community to, to call the shots and define and, and build a process that resonates and, and, and works well in their own community. It has to start with an invitation to collaborate, obviously. This is not something that has ever been a requirement or forced on anyone. We've done, you know, we've, we've made it publicly known that this is something through, through some technical assistance channels has been available. And, and so far we are, we're working in two communities, uh, with the Southern Ute Tribe and with the Yurok Tribe. And those are the tribes that we've been invited to, to participate in. So um, it, it starts with an invitation and we're open to, you know, providing information and having kind of preliminary conversations to see if this is something that might fit in your community. Um, the next step is really getting to know the community. And um, for the communities that have worked with us, they know that that means that we come and we, we visit and we stay and we, we um, spend time getting to know people, getting to know the community, um, listening and listening for the community assets and for the challenges and problems that need to be solved in that, in that community. Um, this is sort of abbreviated, but one of the next steps we do is we, we convene a group of stakeholders, and usually we start by holding fairly open invitation uh, forums for folks when we come in uh, with this project at launch um, and invite people from the community uh, and uh, treatment settings, in the case of the Yurok project, um, the juvenile justice players from neighboring counties were invited to come and, and chime in and take a look at what we were doing. Um, but the goal is to kind of winnow down that larger group to form a team that we've been calling a design team that includes key representatives from the community as defined by the community that we're working with. But always, at least in both instances, someone who is um, an important uh, um, sort of carrier of the knowledge of um, cultural um, elements and um, practices and policies and metaphors and the kinds of things that would make something that they created um, real and important for their community and not just and not just a project with feathers glued onto it. 
The next step in the process is the kind of thing that some of you may have done if you've ever done a strategic planning retreat, where you start to surface what is important and what is wellness. And we go back to the public health wheel and to talk about you know, where, where, do the, where do the practices, uh, where do the critical practices live and what are the important values, ways of talking about things, norms, um, and, and just to surface those um, as, a, as a way of uh, fine tuning how we're going to drive the creation of a model ultimately, which is the goal. And that's what we do next, is we use that values exercise and all the information gathered about the nature of, of the community and, and the difficulty that the youth in that community are having and the kinds of problems that, that surface. And we design a screening and a brief intervention model together. Um, and then kind of go back and forth and refine that um, together with feedback, with a little bit of informal piloting in the Yurok community. Um, we, we got some volunteer youth to, uh, who are graduates of their wellness program to come in and participate in the expert um, model to give us feedback about which things just didn't sound right and seemed corny and which things uh, kind of opened doors for them that helped them to talk about their lives and themselves and in ways that were meaningful for them. And we got great feedback from the young people in the community. Um, and then we focus on, um, once we agree on a consensus model, on training and finding someone, particularly someone locally, who could be the person to pass this on to others, a local trainer, um, and how the, the process will be sustained. So in the generic, that's our, that's our methodology and the steps that we follow. And I'll <clears throat> quickly talk about the model that we created with, with the Yurok community. Um, you'll see in the heading of this slide um, that we don't call it ESPERT, um, and that was their choice, that they, they wanted to give it a a name that made sense to them. And the, the notion of the path, the life path, uh, was um, unanimously preferable to that community than, talking, than giving something a name that implied that we were ferreting out problems and sending people to therapy. That it really was for them about taking young people and the infinite hope and possibility that they see in their young people. and, and both asking them about their path that they're walking and the nature of their path and problems that may be arising and you know boulders in the way and potholes and you know, or maybe a path that looks too short and they can't see too far in the future that they <clears throat> they ask to build uh, the whole process around this metaphor. Um, <clears throat> so we went through the, the the steps that I outlined. We pulled a whole bunch of stakeholders together. The United Indian Health Services came. School every principal from every high school in the area came, and we did the whole process together. Um, and uh, the, the piloting and implementation in this particular case happened in their healing to wellness course that's uh, led by Judge uh, Abinante there. So some of the principles that emerged in the exercise, in the values exercise with this group, were engagement. Um, and I will tell one quick vignette. When I came in, you know, as a, a non-member of the community, hearing that there was a suicide epidemic, and you know, you heard from my bio that I come from a background of working in psychiatric settings, and you know, the kind of alarm bells that tend to go off. I worked for many years in suicide prevention in schools, and hearing that there was a suicide epidemic in this community, I came in thinking, okay, this screening tool has to have significant detection properties. It needs to be a set of questions that helps this community identify who's at risk. And, <clears throat> and when I expressed this idea to them, it was the first thing that they rejected and said that, um, that they don't need a piece of paper um, to understand who's at risk, that they felt that their community was at risk and that they wanted a process that brought them closer to their young people. And so the notion of engagement, and I mentioned this earlier, that um, a screening conversation potentially is an opportunity uh, to build trust and engagement with a young person as opposed to alienating them with a questionnaire which is designed to kind of predict what's wrong with them. But they wanted a, they wanted a screening process which was more informal. Um, and that's where we arrived at this idea of tell me what your life path is like and um, tell me if there are, we didn't shy away from difficult questions. <clears throat> we still asked, um, have you ever thought of shortening your path yourself by harming yourself or taking your life? 
Have you, um, you know, are there things that you might be taking into your body that might be making it difficult to walk your path? And so we asked all the same questions that you might see in a traditional screening, but did it in a very engaging and conversational way. So trust and respect, uh, an attitude of discovery, mutual discovery with the young person. Um, cultural resonance is obviously a major value in the process in general, but was one that they surfaced. They wanted the youth to leave the process feeling empowered as opposed to feeling demoralized and like, oh crap, I have to go to therapy. Um, and recognizing that um, <clears throat> the path forward may require healing and support, but not in every case. Um, and then um, one of the big stamps they put on their process was the notion that the brief intervention, not only in motivating the young person, needed to be about mobilizing community support. And so the third session in a three session process that we created with them really mirrors what you might see in a restorative uh, justice or a restorative circle. And so this is a graphic representation of the path forward model that we created with Yurok, where it begins with charting the young person's path, um, continues with kind of mapping who's in your community, who would you invite to a circle to support you, what relationships need repair, who's likely to help you move forward, who could support you in getting therapy if that's a recommendation, and then literally inviting them to a circle process where um, <clears throat> kind of a review and summary of the first two sessions is, is offered to the group and a dialogue about <clears throat> how the group can support the young person ensues. And so um, this, this adaptation of ESPERT uh, was completely authored by the Yurok community and looks nothing like any other ESPERT model, but really adheres very closely. As I mentioned, it's a roadmap, uh, you know, it's, it's a compass and not a map. It really adheres to the compass that the world uh, public health has been using. The, the noticing and the collaborative motivating of a young person, the building of community supports to, to attain wellness, um, and brevity, <clears throat> the idea that um, you don't pull everyone into a full intervention who doesn't need it. So I will stop there, and I don't know if questions, um, this is a good time for questions or whether we'll do them at the end, but I will turn the mic back over to uh, Anna at this point. Thank you, Evan. Um, I really appreciate everything that you shared. And um, I, one thing that really sticks out to me is um, that meaningfulness of this approach and, you know, how much it differs from some of the traditional things that we see um, in court, which is, which is that alienation that can occur when, you know, you have a judge sitting on a stand and, you know, administering what they think is helpful, but, you know, in some ways, um, you know, we have an open docket and you have a judge saying, you know, I'm ordering you to treatment, I'm ordering you to this assessment, um, and how different and individualized and personal um, that a, a community-based expert approach can be. And so um, I'm really thankful for what you shared today. And, um, yeah, we can pause for questions at the end. Um, we want to make sure and um, allow some time for our next speaker, um, Dr. Allison Kelly. And so we will have time for questions. We're going to, to move forward into our third section. But thank you so much, Evan, for sharing. We'll revisit um, toward the end of the webinar and um, respond to any questions that anyone has um, toward the end. So if you have questions, be thinking about those, um, and we'll address those at the very end of the webinar. So with that, thank you for that conversation. We're going to move um, into our portion with Dr. Allison Kelly. And we have a couple of poll questions for you that um, we wanted to ask just to get some feedback from our audience. And so, um, Nicholas, if you could bring over that first question. Um, I'll read that out loud. Uh, what tribal best practices does your organization or program use and what is the evidence? So if you are currently um, a program that is operating and serving youth and you've implemented um, tribal best practices or evidence-based practices, um, what are those? What do you use? Um, and what is the evidence related to that? And um, Dr. Kelly is with us. And um, if you have any comments about that, um, feel free to add those. And if. Uh, if any of you um, aren't able to share um, or just have thoughts about um, tribal best practices, you can also share those as well. 
Um, if you're not implementing them right now, you can share that. And we just want to get feedback from those of you that are joint, that have joined today um, and see if any of you are utilizing um, best practices in the programs that you're implementing. So we're not seeing a lot of responses. Um, that could be um, for any number of reasons. If you um, are not able to share or um, just not ready to share, that's fine too. You can always share comments in the chat box. Um, Nick, do you want to bring over that second poll? Okay, this question is a little more open. You might have some feelings about that. And the question is, how do you know a tribal best practice is effective? And so how would you know uh, if you're implementing something within your program, if you're seeing um, outcomes? Uh, is there any ideas about how to know if a practice is effective? Feel free to share that in that box. So one way I know, um, having served in programs, if, if seeing if, there, if there's effectiveness um, is reviewing the outcomes, um, seeing if there's positive outcomes coming from the, the project or the practice that you've implemented. Um, are there other ways within your programs that you know what you're doing is effective? And Allison, feel free to weigh in on that, that question. Yeah, well, um, I think that everybody on the call probably has an idea of, of things that are working in their, their communities and the work they're doing and maybe things that aren't working. So we would love to hear um, back from anybody as far as um, of, you know, how you know that, that something is working and it's working well and then how you know that maybe it, it, it's not working as well. And this kind of leads us to our our dialogue today about tribal best practices in youth substance uh, use prevention. And so we can wait a few minutes, Anna, or we can just dive right in and maybe as we, as we go forward with our presentation, there will be more thoughts coming in. Right. Um, so I think I may have blindsided the audience just a little bit with that first question, but we did get some responses to our second question. And um, one of those was to know it's effective, you can talk to the people. You can also see if data has changed for the better. Um, and then the other was seeing a decline in recidivism. So those are definitely ways that you can see if the uh, practices are effective. Um, and we're just going to talk today about that, and I'm going to let Allison have the floor, and uh, we will get going on your portion of this webinar. Okay. Well, thank you, Anna, and thank you, everybody, for being on the call, and Evan and Courtney for the great uh, beginning. This is exciting to, to be with you all today. Um, we're going to kind of take a little bit of a turn from Evan's presentation and talk about uh, tribal best practices and prevention, and it's really based on some work that we've been doing in communities in Montana and Wyoming to document how tribes are preventing substance use in youth. And um, even though the, the focus of our program is on uh, substance use and uh, you know, many of you are working with OJJDP and you might be working with youth who are, uh, and adults even, who are incarcerated. Um, the, what we'll be sharing today really applies to the work that you're doing and kind of building um, from within communities like Courtney and Evan have talked about. Um, so if you want to advance the slide, Anna, that would be great. And so, um, and I apologize if this sounds feels a little disjointed. I'm actually in my car in Poplar on my cell phone, and I don't have uh, the webinar on my screen. So hopefully you won't even notice. But if you do, that's kind of why. Um, so to give you kind of a brief history of our project, um, the TP project is a, a five-year SAMHSA-funded prevention program, initially funded in six communities throughout Montana and Wyoming. That's facilitated by the Rocky Mountain Tribal Leaders Council. And the prevention program is really based on 
the, the idea that culture is prevention. And I know that all of you on the call today probably um, can agree with that, and you have maybe even seen that in the work that you were doing. The evaluation, and that's what I do, um, or some of what I do, um, really focuses on telling the stories in communities of how prevention is happening from the lens of community members and elders and, um, and, and observation even. Um, the approach is tribal and community-based, so everything that we do actually originates in the community, um, and it's based on their evidence and not SAMHSA or OJJDP or a, another researcher's evidence. It's really um, based on what communities know intuitively to work. And the photo that you see in the history slide is of um, some of our TP program staff and the Little Shell Tribe from Great Falls, Montana. And they're one of our uh, uh, tribal sites that's involved in culturally-based prevention and also mentioned in our tribal best practice paper. And I feel like we don't, like 20 minutes is not nearly enough to tell the story of how this paper that I'm really referencing um, in this presentation came about. Um, so I'll invite you to kind of maybe look at that uh, while we're discussing these few slides that we have, if you can pull that up on your uh, WebEx. Um, it was published in the Journal of Ethnicity and Substance Abuse um, just a few months ago and um, was uh, really um, kind of one of the things that we did to, to move this, uh, the work that's happening in culturally-based prevention and our tribal communities forward. And uh, one of the things that I was talking with Anna and Courtney and Evan about is the grandmother's test. So this this idea, and I heard it again actually yesterday in Poplar when um, when one of our directors here was saying, you know, well, we just know that it works. We don't need, you know, a, a data point or we don't need a survey. We know this is working and we know that doesn't work. And, and a lot of times a, a group of elders or grandmothers would even gather around to talk um, and, and share stories about, uh, you know, different teachings and values and practices that have been passed on from generation to generation um, in everything from child, child rearing to um, healthy development to rites of passage, you know, all of these things that we, that have been passed on. There's this, um, this intuition, there's this knowledge and knowing in community of what works and what's happening and what doesn't. And so tribal best practices are really about listening to that intuition and that kind of evidence rather than um, a report or a, a p-value um, that, that shows a significant increase in an outcome that we are, are desiring. And not to get too far off track, but I don't know if many of you were in school in the 80s like me, but we had the D.A.R.E. program, and that was all about not doing drugs. And then in, in early 2000, you know, there was all this research that came out from University of Michigan, actually all over the world, that said that that program was actually not effective at all, and it, it harmed kids. You know, kids that went through D.A.R.E. actually increased their substance use, and it, it had the unintended um, uh, consequences that weren't ever even known, even though um, it was being used as something that was effective. And so I guess my point in telling you that is that we can think that something works because maybe our funding agency or some researcher with a lot of uh, credentials tells us that it does, but um, it, it might not. And I like what Courtney talked about earlier uh, leading us into this discussion about the answers and the solutions. Um, to health and, and healthy communities are actually already in the communities. Um, so if you want to advance the next slide, Anna, we'll talk about our objectives um, from our work with tribal best practices and um, substance use prevention with our tribal communities. Um, in this slide, you'll see a photo of the Fort Peck Creators Game. Um, this is the third annual Creators Game, and it's actually going on this week. And there is so much positive energy um, there's over 125 kids and probably 75 elders and mentors that are here um, to support youth in learning about their culture. And there's fire dancers and lacrosse and horse riding and um, all different things that, that expose youth to not only their culture but also different cultures. Um, and so 
um, this is a tribal best practice. The, the, some of the things, the, the storytelling, the language, the beating, the teachings, the connections that are happening in this uh, creator games is actually a tribal best practice. And so we wanted to document that. And we wanted to document in a way that, that researchers and people that maybe aren't from the community would um, understand. So a lot of our work is about language. And um, and how how we say things and how we document things and so in our, our publication, um, if you're looking at that, we really go into um, what uh, tribal best practices are in the published and in the gray literature. When I say gray, I mean unpublished, just things that you find on the web maybe. Um, and then you know how they're they're shared with other tribes and other communities and maybe even how they're recognized by. Um, funding agencies and policymakers, and so um, we wanted to document the TVPs that we're using in prevention, like the Creators Game, and also um, how they're being used, um, and then share three examples from tribes that that are using them and and um, they're working. And it's also about, like I said, advocating um, to the scientific community and maybe. Um, people that will never come to Poplar, Montana, for example, that, hey, there's really good things going on, and there's a different kind of evidence, and there's a different kind of practice that, that we want to tell you about. And so that's what this is uh, really about. Um, and if you'll advance the next slide. And so just briefly, um, we attended a, a tribal best practice training in, in uh, Bozeman, Montana a couple of years ago with Carolyn Cruz. And she's done tremendous work um, in the field of TBPs and getting the state of Oregon to recognize tribal best practices as being really legitimate for being effective in prevention and even treatment of, um, of, of youth and families that have, have needs. Um, so we attended that training. When I say we, it was our entire team. So we had our tribal site coordinators, myself, our evaluation intern associates that work closely with me in communities, our directors, um, and our cultural coordinator. So we all developed this shared knowledge about what a TBP was. Um, and then we also reviewed TBPs in the literature. And if you look at, if you have the publication up, um, Table 1 provides kind of the definitions of evidence-based practices, practice-based evidence, which uh, Courtney mentioned, and also tribal best practices. And we don't have time to get into um, the differences in those, but Table 1 will give you um, a description of, of what I found the differences to be. Um, but the main thing about tribal best practices is, like I said before, is they're really rooted in oral traditions and histories and observations and values, things like the creators' games, drumming, and even basketball. And they're approved not by a, a scientific advisory board, but they're approved by elders, grandmothers, community members. Um, and that's the kind of evidence. It's very subjective in nature. Um, and it's often connected to the community, to the history, to the language, and and things that are here. And, and they're so powerful. Um, and so table one gives you kind of a definition of how uh, TBPs are different from, say, EBPs, evidence-based practices. And then table two um, on page seven really describes tribal best practice components that we're highlighting in three of our uh, Nor Nor Northern Plains tribes uh, that are working with us. The first is the creator's game, and I mentioned that. I'm, we're here actually doing that right now. Um, also, basketball clinics. Basketball is huge in Indian country, at least uh, we're in the communities that we're working in, and um, that's a tribal best practice. Um, drumming is another tribal best practice, and some of that has been published in the literature as well, but most of that is focused on intervention rather than prevention context. Um, so we reviewed the literature. We documented that the best practices being used um, in the communities that we work in, and then um, our final step is really sharing results, and that's what we're doing today. Um, we're doing that through this publication and also um, with our, the communities that we work in. And there's so many tribal best practices. To only list three seems like it, it's a crime, like we should have had hundreds of them. And one of the key findings of our, our work was that there are so many going on, but there were inconsistencies in how uh, tribes and funding agencies and policymakers were defining them. And so um, we really felt like even though we only found, um, I think it was four tribal best practices for prevention in the literature, 
um, there are many more. And so we really found and feel that uh, tribes and evaluators and directors and, and programs um, that Anna and Courtney and even Evan work on um, can work with tribes to help document those as a way of um, sharing with the rest of the world that, hey, they work, and there's a different kind of evidence that we have, and we want to share it with you. And so um, if you'll advance the next slide. Um, some of the next steps, and this is a photo of a, a basketball clinic at, at uh, Northern Cheyenne, and, and some of you might be wondering about basketball and how that's a tribal best practice. Um, there are so many things, positive things about basketball when community members come together, and we've, we've documented some of those um, in our table too, but basketball is about teamwork and life skills and health and cultural connections. We tie in culture and teaching into those camps. Um, it's about being healthy and having positive relationships with peers and also adults that are trusted in the community. And so, um, you know, it, it's, it, and, and we've, we've done that work at Northern China for several years, working in the community to support those camps um, and even attending uh, games throughout the season to collect information uh, from the community about prevention and what they want and what tribal pr best practices they, they're using how they stay healthy. And so it's this different way of um, looking at prevention about uh, uh, we can create a new narrative of what's working, and it's all based on what's in the community already. So it's really powerful. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to leave you with um, some next steps that we plan to do. And then I have kind of a, some thoughts about uh, maybe our you know, working uh, towards this goal of advocacy and uh, different kinds of evidence in the future. Um, I know that in the work that we're doing in our, in our communities um, and any proposals or policies or anything that we put forward, we will always honor the tribes and, and their wishes to do tribal best practices. And there are many different ways to work with funding agencies. I think they're getting better, actually, to use these TBPs rather than something that's um, maybe a, developed for a non-tribal community that, that won't work. Because um, it's all about context, you know? Um, and context is totally different, you know? So what, what, what works for one community and one program won't, and then we know um, that even programs we think that work, you know, don't. And, uh, and DARE would be an example. Um, the other message that, that is, is so clear um, that, that this work is doing, um, and I'm sure that you all are doing, is it's about strengthening the capacity of tribes to, to use what they have rather than reaching outside their community, but to be reaffirmed in that knowledge and those teachings. Um, and then the last question, you know, we, we, we can more rigorously evaluate these tribal best practices to be um, maybe on interrupts list as a evidence-based intervention, but the question is kind of why would we do that if we know that they work? Um, and so um, I don't know I, that I have the answer to that. Um, I think there are some creative ways that we can work with data to show um, uh, different kinds of evidence, and that's something that we're considering in the future. Um, but overall, it's, um, it's about you know, keeping the, the best practices alive in communities and revitalizing that culture and reaffirming it. Um, and that's really about what um, our work in prevention is about, and it's been tremendously effective. One of the things that's not on this slide or even in the publication is that we have found We've surveyed over 580 youth who have been involved in our prevention activities. And we see a clear link between social support, community connections, and um, reduced substance use. So we ask all about you know, how different drugs and use in the last 30 days. Um, and we see that when youth feel more connected to their culture and they feel socially supported, uh, they don't use as, as much as youth who do. And so we have those kinds of data which, which even reaffirm more the knowledge and the evidence that, that we are encouraged by um, through this work. So I'll leave it at that. I would love to entertain any questions, and I'm just so grateful that you all were uh, listening today. It feels a little quiet on the line, so I'll stop talking. Thank you so much, Allison. Um,
I appreciate what you shared, and um, I think it comes from that perspective of, you know, understanding and recognizing um, that what these communities are doing um, is effective. And when we look at, you know, historically um, evidence-based practices, um, a consideration for what tribes are doing, um, what's being implemented at the community level, um, and a clear recognition of the effectiveness of it. So thank you so much for sharing. We do have um, a few minutes for questions. Um, if you have any, you can enter those into the question and answer box. Um, if you have any comments, you can insert those in the chat box. We'll be happy to um, share those with the group. So um, Courtney or Evan, did you guys have any um, comments or um, closing thoughts? Um, no, just that I look, I look forward to I know the webinar format is kind of challenging for folks, and I wish we were all in a room together and could dialogue, but I look forward to folks reaching out to me if they want to talk about our work and, and hearing what people thought about today. I really appreciated uh, Courtney and, and the other presentations today. Thanks. Yeah, and I'll just uh, second that and support uh, <clears throat> all of the that's been shared today with our presenters. I thank you for your insights. Um, <clears throat> again, like Evan said, if, uh, being in the room, being able to share is ideal, but uh, what we're trying to do is learn from one another and our experiences and uh, working within the, the communities and um, working with the young people. And uh, so there's a lot of really good um, lessons learned and opportunities for us to share. Um, but again, we thank you. Any questions that you have, please feel free to, to contact the TA Center. Uh, Anna Clough has put her email address down there. Um, our website URL is tribalyouthprogram.org. You can visit that for resources, also request technical assistance, and one of our TA coordinators will be in touch with you. And um, if you want to Again, a copy of this webinar. Uh, it will be placed on, archived on our website. Um, <clears throat> and if you want to follow up with any of the presenters, we'll help connect you to them. Uh, we thank you for your time and joining. Um, Anna, that, that's about all I got. So. Thank you. And yeah, we did want to say a repeat. Um, we have contact information for our presenters um, below. So if you think of questions or just have a follow-up, um, comment uh, after the webinar, feel free to reach out. Um, also visit our website or email us anytime. My email address is up there. Um, we're happy to, to connect you um, further with our presenters or any information or follow-up from this webinar. Um, and we appreciate you joining us today. And we do have a webinar survey link at the bottom. We appreciate your feedback. Um, it helps us to do a better job. And so any comments or feedback that you have, we would greatly appreciate appreciate you filling out our webinar survey. And so if there are no other questions, we'll probably wrap up for today. We'll leave um, this window open so you have time to do the webinar survey. But thank you again to Evan Elkin and to Allison Kelly. Um, we appreciate your time, your contribution, and your support for tribal youth. Um, and to all of our participants today, um, we hope you have a great rest of your week. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today.